Welcome back. This is the third talk in our series um, entitled John F. Kennedy and Almost Missed Calculation. On the night of October 27, 1962, SAC bombers armed with nuclear weapons, each with 70 times the destructive power of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima, circled the Arctic skies. Each had designated targets within the Soviet Union. Nearly 100 warships maintained quarantine in the Caribbean as more readied for invasion and U.S. destroyers patrolled constantly in the Atlantic with enemy submarines armed with nuclear torpedoes only a few fathoms below them. As the 5th Marine Expeditionary Brigade began boarding the ships to invasion staging areas, 14,000 Air Force reservists that had been called in that night were saying goodbyes and moving to their active duty stations. At all times, military aides were within a 90-second hail of the president, handing off to each other every eight hours the black vinyl satchel known as the football, which contained the codes that the president alone had the authority to use, and that if used, would unleash a rain of nuclear bombs. <clears throat> Watching the sun set that Saturday night, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara wondered if he would live out the week. As most of the nation slept unaware that night, we were within a hair's breadth of nuclear annihilation. How do we come to this? Where had it all begun? The eminent historian Barbara Tuckman once observed that all war is the result of miscalculation. She wrote of this eloquently in The Guns of August, a one-page history devoted entirely to the first critical month of World War I, the month of August 1914. In June 1961, 47 years after The Guns of August first fired, a shaken 44-year-old President John F. Kennedy, only five months into office, handed a copy of Tuckman's book to British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. The seasoned diplomat Harold Macmillan found Kennedy overwhelmed by the ruthlessness and barbarity of Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Kennedy had just stopped in London on his way home from a fateful June 1961 Vienna summit with Khrushchev. It was a summit that would set the stage for the dramatic set of events that would unfold over the next 16 months, culminating in October 1962. Roughest thing in my life, he told James Reston of the New York Times, immediately after. He just beat the hell out of me. Kennedy had the same bush of brown hair, the same calm, ruddy face, and the same penetrating blue eyes as he had as a 23-year-old Harvard collegian when he wrote When England Slept. But the shadows around his eyes had darkened, and the lines there and at the corners of his mouth were now more deeply etched. Kennedy, reading Tuckman at the time, shuddered at the sudden foreboding that he had just met a world leader as unstable and impetuous as Kaiser Wilhelm, the German emperor whose personality flaws and miscalculations, according to Tuckman, were in great part responsible for unleashing the dogs of war in 1914 and the eventual death of 30 million souls. But now in 1961, the stakes were much higher than in 1914. The American nuclear monopoly had long since ended, and man's capacity for destruction had magnified many times over, so that now the two mortals, Kennedy and Khrushchev, held in their hands buttons capable of destroying over half of all mankind. I never met a man like this, Kennedy told Hugh Seide of time upon his return from Vienna. I talked about how a nuclear exchange would kill 70 million people in 10 minutes. And he just looked at me as if to say, so what? Later on Air Force One, Saidi had found the president sitting in boxer shorts, his eyes red and watery, dark pockets beneath them. After Saidi left and before going to sleep, JFK scribbled a quotation 
Lincoln had used at the end of a campaign. I know there's a God and I see a storm coming. If he has a place for me, I believe I'm ready. Kennedy had just spent three chilling days with Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, a rough-hewn bully of a man whose first son, Leonid, now deceased, had been Kennedy's contemporary. Khrushchev was a man taking Kennedy's measure. When Kennedy, against the dire warnings of his senior advisors, had ventured into a discussion of communist ideology and expansionism, and Ala Tuckman explained that miscalculation would have dire consequences, Khrushchev had gone berserk and bellowed, miscalculation, miscalculation, miscalculation. All I ever hear from you people and your news correspondence is that damn word, miscalculation. You ought to just take that word, bury it in cold storage, never use it again, I'm sick of it. But events in Vienna would indeed lead the Soviet premier to miscalculate. And over the succeeding 16 months, the result of his miscalculations would bring humanity closer to total destruction than at any time in history would happen like this. The Prince of Camelot had arrived in Vienna from Paris and brought with him uh, the much admired Jacqueline, or Jacqueline as she was called in Paris. Pair had taken Washington by storm since their inauguration. The torch had indeed been passed to a new generation. They were a pronounced contrast from the more banal Beltway crowd that had preceded them. Just a week previous to uh, Vienna, before an adoring crowd in Paris, Kennedy had endearingly quipped, permit me to introduce myself. I'm the man who accompanied Jack Lee Kennedy to Paris. The crowd of Parisians loved it and roared their approval. It seemed enthralled by the glamour of the uh, handsome young couple, the intellectual and artistic elan they had bestowed on the White House, which after a long hiatus was now home to little children again, children playing with a pony named Macaroni running around the floors, hiding under desks in the Oval Office. Even the granite-lipped Charles de Gaulle, taken with Jackie, had remarked he was the one thing he hoped to bring back with him from America. But the Kennedys had overdone it in Paris, at least Jack had. He suffered severe and chronic back pain, was often on crutches. The private was taking heavy doses of steroids for Addison's disease and nearly always fatal disease of the adrenal glands and was secretly receiving daily doses of uh, medically questionable uh, injections which included Novocaine, amphetamines and steroids from the so-called doctor to the stars Max Jacobson. Now many were convinced this Jacobson was a quack. His mystical concoctions would never have been tolerated for any other chief of state. But they made JFK feel good, and at least temporarily so. And so medical ethics be damned. Uh, Kennedy, who had been chronically ill most of his adult life, and had already been given the last rites of the Catholic Church, was uh, fatalistic about his chances of living very long. He marched to the tune of his own drummer. But steroids had been known to prompt severe highs and severe lows. All of this may well have subjected the president to drastic mood swings in his first one-on-one -on -one with the Soviet premier. What is clear is that he was severely affected by the encounter. The personality gap between the two men, Kennedy and Khrushchev, could not have been more pronounced. By his own admission, Kennedy had never met a man he could not charm. He did not charm Khrushchev. Staffers who spotted the two men strolling together on the grounds in Vienna reported that Khrushchev paced circles around Kennedy, snapping at him like a terrier, shaking his fist. The Soviets were amazed that the president seemed so affected and scared. The veteran diplomats, this kind of bravado by the Soviet premier was simply par for the course. Jubilant over Yuri Gagarin, recent flight into space, Sputnik, Buoyed by Kennedy's reluctance to fight even Fidel Castro's ill-equipped Third World Army in Cuba, Khrushchev had decided to overwhelm the young president rather than to use the summit as an opportunity to develop detente. He had succeeded. Kennedy was deeply depressed as he left Vienna. Pivotally, Khrushchev could sense it. And thus began the great 
miscalculation. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, 23 years Kennedy's senior, first saw the light of day in 1894 in a mud hut with a thatched roof. His fatherless most of his young life, son of peasants from Kursk, who had um, been driven from their land and their home by poverty. The noted English biographer Edward Crankshaw gives a revealing account of Khrushchev's roots. His grandfather was a serf, essentially a slave. Father's lifetime ambition merely to own a horse, never realized. The infant Khrushchev, writes Crankshaw, was lucky to survive. There was nothing in the background to distinguish him from a hundred million other peasants so primitive and backward in their attitudes and standards, they belong in a different world from ours. 20th century world to which shock and dismay would soon learn of the pent-up violence into which the infant Khrushchev was born. By the time John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born into lace curtain Irish comfort in 1917, Khrushchev had not only lived through Tuckman's month of August 1914, he had survived the First World War and the 1917 October Red Revolution as well. He had become a ruthless and violent army, Red Army Bolshevik. Kennedy's youth in stark contrast was passed among the elite, the intelligentsia, dutifully followed his brothers into the Tony Prep School of Choate, then into Harvard. Khrushchev left school at nine to herd the village cows. He emerged alive from the savage battle of Stalingrad, uh, which would turn the tide uh, in the East in the Second World War. He'd go on to survive innumerable Stalinist purges and the assassination of most of his Politburo colleagues. He was, in fact, suspected of having engineered a number of them himself. Well, how could JFK, the son of privilege, be expected to sympathize with that, to grasp the Weltanschauung of a man from a world so distant from his own that it was not unlike that of another planet? JFK had been shattered. A week earlier, Kennedy and his glamorous entourage had arrived at the airport in Vienna amid great fanfare. Chris Jobs, quite unlike the dazzling Camelot caravan, had arrived in Vienna quietly by train, met by only a small group of party apparatchiks. Khrushchev's third wife, Nina Petrovna, although wily and clever, was as plump and dowdy as Jackie was slim and stylish. It was a contrast not lost on their Austrian hosts. Khrushchev was not amused. The contrasting receptions and appearances may well have added to his displeasure. His skepticism was understandable. He was, after all, a self-made man who had slashed his way from a legacy of virtual serfdom and cursed to the top of the presidium, possibly the most deadly political charnel house on the Asian or European continents, both of which it spanned. Now, here in Vienna, he sat face to face with a fop, no older than his first son, Leonid. Kennedy appeared to him as a callow youth, with a smile right out of a toothpaste ad, with a full shock of hair and an unlined youthful face to match. Moreover, he was the scion of a prototypical capitalist father, a patriarch who had no doubt prospered at the expense of the working class, and eventually, and cynically, bought his son's way to the top. Kennedy, by the way, wasn't uh, shy about this heritage. He had once, in jest, read an imagined telegram from his generous daddy, Joseph. It read, Dear Jack, don't buy a single vote more than is necessary. I'll be damned if I'll pay for a landslide. <laughs> the vagaries of the Chicago and West Virginia 1960 election campaigns could not possibly have been lost on Soviet intelligence, nor was the Bay of Pigs disaster. Immediately following his inauguration, uh, Kennedy had listened to military and intelligence advisors who assured him that an invasion of Cuba by CIA-trained expatriates without direct American military intervention would succeed and that the expatriates would go on uh, to form an interim government which would be welcomed with open arms by a Cuban populace. Of course, it was all a fantasy. They were wrong on every count. The 1,500-man invasion army was decimated on the beach by Castro's 
25,000-man Cuban army. Kennedy had reportedly wept at the needless loss of life. On April 17, 1961, only four months into office, Kennedy uh, had blundered into the most damaging miscalculation of his young career. At a press conference following the disaster, he was magnanimous in accepting full responsibility for the defeat, stating, I am the responsible officer of this government. The American public found the admission refreshing. Kennedy's approval ratings jumped to an all-time high of 83%. When he was told, Kennedy amused noted, I have a total fiasco and my poll ratings go up. What am I going to do to get him up further? And the disaster had caused him to lose stature, however, among our European allies. The veteran Dean Acheson reported the Europeans felt they were watching a gifted young amateur practicing with a boomerang, uh, which uh, they saw to their horror that he had knocked himself out. Kennedy again countered with humor. When we Democrats got into office, the thing that surprised us the most was to find that things were actually as bad as we'd been saying they were. Tragedy had served, however, as a vital wake-up call. Unlike the Kaiser in 1914, Kennedy would never again allow himself to be swayed by crusading military commanders. The CIA were subordinates eager for imperial glory at the cost of other men's lives. Kennedy was acutely aware of Barbara Tuckman's vivid description of how a vacillating and deeply flawed Kaiser had just offered his services as a mediator of peace in August 1914. Now he had been cowed by his foreign office and General von Moltke uh, into reversing himself. And how he had then ratified rather than interdicted uh, the attack on Belgium that began that fatal conflict. Kaiser Wilhelm knew full well at the time, following the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand by Serbian radicals in August 1914, that the humble apology of the Serbian government was more than sufficient reason for the Germans and the Austrians to hold their fire. But General von Moltke, whose career was invested in the uh, attack, had protested to Wilhelm. The troops are already marching toward Belgium. Nothing can now be changed with regard to deployment. The Kaiser now inexplicably reversed himself and relented. The slaughter began. Personality traits may well have played a major role. Truman was right. The uh, Kaiser was a pretend militarist, a narcissist with over 50 different military uniforms in his closet. He had fought all his life to overcome a stigma of inferiority resulting from a congenitally atrophied left arm. And Valtmoki knew it, knew full well that the Kaiser was particularly vulnerable to the taunts of his generals. Ironically, the fate of 30 million persons was to rest on just such thin reeds of idiosyncratic personality. But now, the fate of perhaps two billion souls would now rest on even thinner reeds of personality in October 1962. Well, Kennedy had his own General von Moltke in the person of uh, Air Force General Curtis LeMay commander of the Strategic Air Command. LeMay, a war hawk, was caricatured, you may remember, in the film Dr. Strangelove in the person of Air Force General Buck Turgidson, uh, head of the Strategic Air Command played by George C. Scott. It was all based on Red Alert, a novel about a rogue U.S. military officer who attempted to initiate an unauthorized attack uh, on the Soviet Union, an authorized nuclear attack at that. Kennedy vowed that he'd never again be dragged into war by hawkish men like LeMay, whose professional careers were vested in the conflict. But as we will see, LeMay almost had his way. JFK's appointment of RFK, Robert Kennedy, as his attorney general, was widely criticized as cynical nepotism. Kennedy countered, I see nothing wrong with giving Robert some legal experience as Attorney General of the United States before he actually goes out to practice law. Later, an attorney wrote Kennedy suggesting that Robert, due to his racket-busting experience, would make a better president. I consulted Bobby about it, replied JFK, and to my dismay, 
guy, do you appeal to him? From here on in, however, Bobby would prove to be JFK's closest confidant, and his secret mission on October 27th, as we'll see, would ultimately prove quite significant. Kennedy's first ordeal by fire would be Berlin. The missile crisis would follow. Robert Kennedy, now his brother's key advisor, established a critical back-channel relationship with Georgi Bolshakov, a hard-drinking, clownish, barrel-chested Secret Service officer at the Soviet Embassy in Washington. Bolshakov enjoyed a special relationship with Khrushchev. He was a drinking buddy of Khrushchev. Robert Kennedy's meetings with Bolshakov and later with Ambassador Dobrynin when Bolshakov fell out of favor, uh, would prove critical in what transpired over the next 16 months. Bobby warned Bolshakov that JFK preferred death to surrender. In an attempt to buttress that impression himself, JFK now approved a $3.5 billion military buildup, asked Congress to triple draft call, call up reserves, fund preparation of fallout shelters for nuclear war. On July 25, 1961, he announced publicly that he would not permit Premier Khrushchev to end our commitment to West Berlin. That reserves were being called up, fallout shelters we've built, and finally to sum it up, we seek peace, we shall not surrender. Upon reading the talk, Khrushchev called Ambassador John McCloy, who was Dasha in the Black Sea, and defiantly announced that the United States had just declared preliminary war in the Soviet Union. Soviets had a 100 megaton hydrogen bomb, the largest in the world, and his scientists were eager to use it. He would sign a German pre peace treaty no matter what. Access would be cut off to Berlin, and the United States would have to make a deal with East Germany. If you try to force your way through, he blustered, we will oppose you by force. War is bound to be thermonuclear, and though you and we may survive, all of your European allies will be completely destroyed. In a Bolshoi theater performance by Margot Fontaine, great ballet dancer, in Moscow between Fontaine's pirouettes and plies, he warned an aghast British ambassador, Robert, that if the Western powers sent new forces to Germany, he would respond a hundredfold. Six hydrogen bombs would be enough to destroy the British Isles, he fumed, and nine would take care of France. Then, why should 200 million people die for two million in Berlin? It was a great bluster, Khrushchev. But East Germany was hemorrhaging people. Thousands were fleeing daily into West Berlin, and their numbers were increasing as tensions rose. Kennedy was trying to send Khrushchev subtle signals as to what we would and would not tolerate. On Sunday morning, July 30th, Senator Fulbright, who was then head of the Foreign Relations Committee, remarked on television, I don't understand why the Germans don't close the border, because I think they have the right to do it. In a press conference shortly afterwards, the president failed to disavow Fulbright's contention. The president then admitted privately to Wal Rostow, perhaps a wall might be erected, and if so, we could do nothing about it. Well, Khrushchev finally got it. He now privately told his generals, we'll put up serpentine barbed wire and the West will stand there like dumb sheep. And while they're standing there, we'll finish the wall. He then sent another message to Kennedy, this time through Italian ambassador Fanfani, that if war came over Berlin, it would be nuclear from the start. As intended, the shock Fanfani reported the threat from Khrushchev, but significantly, there was no rejoinder from Kennedy. Predictably then, on the weekend of August 11th, heavily armed Soviet troops suddenly appeared at the perimeter of West Berlin, armed with bullhorns, jackhammers, and axes. As Khrushchev had boasted, first barbed wire did go up, and then before anyone could react, the wall was erected. When the news spread in East Berlin, thousands fled to subways and train stations, only to be told it was too late. Some shouted, others were arrested, uh, many wept. Privately, Kennedy told his aides, you know, a wall's a hell of a lot better than a war. He was relieved, actually. Perhaps the most dangerous miscalculation of the 20th century, that of Khrushchev in Cuba, was still to come. But launched at the Bay of Pigs, 
confirmed in Vienna, now been ratified in Berlin, where, as he boastfully predicted, Kennedy and his allies had indeed stood around like dumb sheep as the wall went up. But were these impressions by themselves enough to trigger Khrushchev's great gamble in the Caribbean? I feel not. No comprehension of the miscalculations that led the world to the edge of the nuclear cataclysm is possible without, without an understanding of the mounting dilemmas confronting Khrushchev throughout the entire period. First, on the domestic front, there had been poor harvests. The average Soviet citizen now faced, uh, at best, inordinately high food prices, commodity prices, and worse starvation. Industrial growth was slowing, consumer goods were in short supply, civil disobedience had already necessitated bloody Soviet military intervention in the Novichokask. Secondly, the Soviets still rankled at East Germans despite the wall, now risked their lives to escape from the utopian Soviet enclave in the East. The number had died in the process. Thirdly, the Soviet Union suffered the further indignity of our missile bases close to its borders, most notably in Turkey. The removal of these was to become the pivotal issue during the deliberations of XCOM. If you listen to the tapes of XCOM and they're available, you read the transcripts, 90% of the discussion is about removal of the uh, missiles from Turkey. Fourth, there was the further disgrace of Cuba, a defenseless Soviet satellite. The U.S. was already conducting naval maneuvers close by Cuba. Khrushchev felt an invasion was imminent. Fifth, there was the awkward missile gap. Despite Gagarin and Sputnik, Khrushchev was painfully aware the United States had several times as many ICBMs as the Soviets, a far superior nuclear submarine class to Polaris, and twice the number of missile-equipped long-range bombers. But perhaps more important than all of this was the specter of a rising China. This daunting phenomenon hovered over Khrushchev like the sword of Damocles. Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping were thus the unseen players in the missile crisis that would unfold in the Caribbean in October 1962. Soviet relations with China had deteriorated markedly since the triumphal Moscow Conference of 1957, hosted by Khrushchev and dominated by the Soviets. The Chinese had at first been thrilled to be treated as equals within the world communist movement, but Khrushchev had squirmed as he listened to an exuberant Mao announce that if 300 million Chinese were killed, well, there would still be 300 million left alive. He was palpably aware uh, that there were 600 million Chinese, but only 220 million Russians at the time. It was not his intention to preside over the obliteration of the Soviet Union to the greater glory of Chinese Marxism, Leninism. This Mao was a veritable madman, out of control. Khrushchev had adamantly refused to give him either the atomic bomb or rockets, and the relationship would rapidly deteriorate. But their confrontations, though bitter, were still a well-kept secret within the communist world. By November 1960, Deng Xiaoping brazenly accused Khrushchev of having betrayed the revolution, declaring in so many words in the heart of Moscow that China proposed to take the leadership away from Russia. Khrushchev knew full well that the leaders of the 81 communist nations uh, were beginning to choose sides in an apparent war to the death between the two communist behemoths, something dramatic was called for. Understood in this light, his near-fatal October 1962 miscalculation in Cuba was a manifestation of a much deeper malaise. The Colossus, launched by events at Versailles, which we discussed in our first session, that had now become communist China, had come first circle, full circle to torment Khrushchev, and resultantly had become a significant but unseen factor in the most dangerous threat of total annihilation the West had ever faced. Khrushchev, sensing that Kennedy was cowed by his threats at Vienna, 
now felt he could exploit the threat of nuclear war without actually going to war. There was a move open on the chessboard. And all of his life, Khrushchev had been an inveterate gambler. In 1956, shortly following Stalin's death, Khrushchev had denounced Stalin and denounced Stalinism in the so-called secret speech of the 20th Party Congress. It's a dangerous and daring roll of the dice that launched the rise to power of Khrushchev within the deadly post-Stalinist presidium. He had gambled that the success of Sputnik in 1958 could be manipulated to create an illusion of Soviet missile and nuclear superiority. The gamble had succeeded in getting the U.S. to bargain with him as an equal despite our vastly superior destructive power. Moreover, Khrushchev, who made decisions on his own, was described by former aides as an azarki, which means reckless or hot-headed in Russia. The world bore witness to their observation in the infamous shoe-pounding display at the United Nations. And now, intoxicatingly, there was the island of Cuba. A move was available uh, to the intrepid gambler. He'd established rocket bases there, not most secrecy, armed them with nuclear warheads, then announced their presence as a fait accompli in New York in November at the uh, meeting of the UN. Once the armed missiles were in place, Kennedy would not dare risk bombing the missile bases. Such an attack uh, would open up the U.S. mainland uh, to the horror of nuclear annihilation. If even one of the missile launchers uh, were to survive our bombing attack, Khrushchev's nuclear missiles would be within the range of cities as far north as Washington, D.C. and New York City. Kennedy would never retaliate. The boy president cowered in Virginia, at Vienna, had he not done that? He had shrunk from confrontation at the Bay of Pigs, Berlin. The stakes were high. The Soviet Union and not China. The Soviet Union and not China would now be crowned once and for all as the dominant player in the communist world. And Khrushchev would now deal with the U.S. from a position of strength despite the Soviets' gaping missile inferiority all led to the grand miscalculation. It all went terribly wrong. And for 13 terrifying days, the fate of civilization as we knew it would hang in the balance. On Monday night, October 15, 1962, day one, McGeorge Bundy was informed that an unarmed U-2 reconnaissance pilot uh, by the name of Major Rudolf Anderson had photographed Soviet medium-range missiles being installed near San Cristobal, Cuba. 16 to 24 of those missiles capable of striking targets as far north as the capital in New York City that would be operational within two weeks. Armed with atomic warheads, they could kill 80 million Americans. Convening an immediate meeting of the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, called XCOM for short, JFK uh, sought to explore all options, but insisted that none be taken at once. Outside their conference room at the Department of State, they would post a sign, nuclear powers make war like porcupines make love, carefully. The key factor in the equation was time. There was not much time, but Kennedy would not be rushed into things uh, as he was rushed by the military and the CIA into the Bay of Pigs, or as Kaiser Wilhelm, for that matter, had been rushed into the war by General von Mulkey in 1914. The president's initial inclination was for an immediate airstrike, but he purposely absented himself from the first few XCOM meetings. A collegial sense of shared responsibility was crucial. When SAC commander Curtis LeMay remarked that the president was in pretty bad fix, Kennedy immediately snapped back, you're in there with me. No difference to rank or quarter was given. Witness this tense colloquy between Dean Acheson, formerly Harry Truman's Secretary of State, and who was a military airstrike advocate, immediate military airstrike. Well, what will the Soviets do in response, Acheson was asked. Well, I know the Soviet Union pretty well, he replied somewhat arrogantly. I uh, I think they will uh, knock out our bases in Turkey. 
Well, what will we do then? Well, under our NATO treaty, which uh, I was associated, uh, we would be obligated to respond by knocking out a base inside the Soviet Union. Well, what will they do then? Why then, Atchison replied with some degree of irritation, but a little less sure of himself, that's when we hope cooler heads will prevail and they will want to talk. A chill descended on the room. The former so-called wise man of the Truman administration had unwittingly stumbled into the great unknown. It was, of course, impossible to know where a so-called limited nuclear war would end. We hope cooler heads will prevail? No way! That so-called hope, voiced by the now somewhat deflated Dean Acheson, was not an acceptable answer. Half thought through scenarios, even if they emanated from so-called foreign policy masterminds, would not do. Not when the fate of half mankind lay in the balance. Well, now, of course, an all-out nuclear war was not just the stuff of science fiction. At that moment, an all-out nuclear war was imminent. Evacuation plans were prepared. Pink identification slips were issued to the president and essential members of the cabinet to accompany him to an underground bunker in the Blue Ridge Mountains in West Virginia. Helicopter crews dressed from head to toe in protective clothing were preparing to smash their way into the White House, into the bomb shelter with acetylene torches and crowbars, bundle the president into a radiation suit and fly him out of the rubble. Contingency plans were in place to rescue Federal Reserve assets and national treasures such as the Declaration of Independence, masterpieces from the National Gallery of Art. Although XCOM was initially split almost down the middle, despite the objections of the military and the CIA, the team had finally settled on a blockade rather than bombing. An airstrike could not be surgical and would lead to invasion. The world would neither understand nor forget an attack without warning like Pearl Harbor. A blockade was a flexible, less aggressive beginning, the least likely to precipitate war, most likely to cause the Soviets to back down. Khrushchev had deceitfully represented in writing numerous letters to Kennedy. No missiles were being sent to Cuba. The lie was reiterated repeatedly by Foreign Minister Gromyko in person. Kennedy felt a profound sense of betrayal, but there was no time now for the luxury of anger. Ominous things were happening on the ground, in the air, and at sea, happenings that would strongly support the first strike option. It would soon go to DEFCON 2, that's Defense Condition 2, an alert never before reached in the 16-year history of the Strategic Air Command. DEFCON 1 is war. We were that close. There was no evidence whatsoever the Soviets were backing down. 22,000 Russians in Cuba were still working frantically to make the missiles operational. Unbeknown to U.S. intelligence, the Soviets had already installed nuclear warheads on ground-to-air missiles only 15 miles away from our base at Guantanamo and the invasion beaches. They could reach the invasion beaches in seconds. The dangers of an accidental nuclear confrontation were mind-boggling. 162-minute-men missiles in underground silos in Montana under the command of LeMay had already been assigned targets in the Soviet Union. Their missile crews were on maximum alert. They could all be launched in 32 seconds by the mere push of a few buttons. And LeMay, who had already accused the president of a Munich-like retreat, might well prove to be a loose cannon. Loaded B-52 Stratocruisers with assigned Soviet targets, also under the command of the Manic LeMay, were already in the air. Their crews were resigned to the fact that it was unlikely that they would accomplish their whole mission, as a nuclear exchange would probably mean uh, that the world as they knew it would be at an end. And we had 1,200 planes carrying 2,858 nuclear warheads to back them up. In a work entitled The 20th Century Book of the Dead, Gil Elliott, an enterprising Scottish writer, 
calculated that in the 20th century alone, 100 million people had been destroyed already through human violence. At the time Eliot wrote, we were just over halfway through that deadliest of all centuries to date. The World Health Organization had estimated that a nuclear war would kill half the population of the Earth. Two billion people. In October 1962, fate had now conspired to place that decision in the hands of diametric opposites, men who harbored very real physical and psychological frailties, just as had the Kaiser in 1914. On Monday, October 22, day seven of the crisis, Kennedy finally took to the airwaves to inform the American public of the Soviet duplicity in Cuba and to describe the quarantine that we had just put in place. The term quarantine, incidentally, had been inserted because the term blockade was a casus belli, reason, cause for war. He then went on to throw down the gauntlet to Khrushchev with these words, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Upon hearing this, Khrushchev apparently reportedly panicked. Cuba had been his ultimate roll of the dice, but this time he had lost. Whatever could have gone wrong had gone wrong. His missiles were currently helpless on the ground in Cuba. They could easily be bombed out of existence. He had lied to Kennedy about this very thing, been caught red-handed, and now he had not only destroyed all possibility of detente, but the Soviet Union was about to be humiliated in the eyes of the world, above all, by the dreaded Chinese. Foreign Relations Committee uh, Senators Russell of Georgia, Fulbright of Arkansas, and others were briefed two hours before the president's address that Monday. They were furious, echoing General LeMay and Dean Acheson. They demanded that the United States bomb the hell out of the Cuban missile sites and invade Cuba. Fortunately, they had not been informed or consulted earlier. The American public's reaction to Kennedy's speech was immediate, and it was drastic. And some sought to flee, others to hide resupply their fallout shelters. Panic buying ensued. Fistfight broke out in Los Angeles over the last can of pork and beans in the supermarket. Washington, the basement of the National Cathedral, was purposely flooded as an emergency reservoir. Gallows humor began to circulate, mocking as hapless civil defense films, instructing students to hide under their desks. A continent apart, Khrushchev had become irrational threatening that Soviet submarines would sink any American vessel, forcing a Soviet ship to stop. As he did so, two Soviet ships were within a few miles of our quarantine barrier. A Russian submarine then moved into position between the two ships. Helicopters from the carrier Essex hovered overhead, carrying anti-submarine weapons. Robert Kennedy would write of those moments, quote, I think these moments were the time of gravest concern for the president. Was the world on the brink of a holocaust? Was it our error? Was there something further that should have been done or not done? The president's hand went up to his face, covered his mouth. He opened and closed his fist. His face seemed drawn, his eyes pained, almost gray. We stared each other across the table. For a few fleeting seconds, it was almost as if no one else was there and he was no longer the president. Inexplicably, I thought of when he was ill, almost died, and when he had lost his first child, when we learned that our older brother Joe had been killed, of personal times of strain and hurt, the voices droned on and on, but I didn't hear anything until I heard the president say, isn't there some way we can avoid having our first exchange with a Russian submarine? Almost anything but that. No, there's too much danger, too much danger to our ships. There's no alternative, said McNamara. 
1,000 miles away in the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, the final decisions were going to be made in the next few minutes. President Kennedy had initiated the course of events, but he no longer had control over them. And then at 10.25 a.m., a messenger brought in a report to John McCone. Soviet ships at the edge of the quarantine had stopped to turn back. There was a momentary sigh of relief. It was short-lived. Kennedy would later say that it seemed to him at that point that the odds of the Soviets going to war were between one out of three and even. Little did he know then, for example, how close we would come to the start of World War III at that very spot in the vast ocean on Black Saturday, October 27th, just a few days later. He did not yet know of a submarine commander named Valentin Stavisky, nor did Khrushchev. Kennedy knew Khrushchev must now be given a graceful way to get out. With Tuckman's prescient guns of August, no doubt, ever on his mind, Kennedy informed Khrushchev of how national leaders had stumbled into World War I. In doing so, he again used the very word that had sent Khrushchev into a fit of paroxysms of rage in Vienna, miscalculation. The great danger and risk of all this, he wrote, is a miscalculation, a mistake in judgment. Khrushchev was now well aware that he had blundered into what could well become the greatest miscalculation in the history of mankind. As tension built on Wednesday morning, day nine, Kennedy had issued orders to sink any Soviet sub interfering with the quarantine. That order almost proved fatal. On day nine, the Soviet ships nearest Cuba had stopped but they had not turned back, and the crisis was far from over. Soviet missile assembly work in Cuba still went on at full speed. 1,000 blanket bombing sorties had already been planned by LeMay for the first two attack days alone. JFK had not given in to LeMay to bomb and invade, but it was becoming increasingly difficult to fend him off, and the danger of a confrontation at sea was still ever-present. On Friday evening, day 11, a long, rambling letter from Khrushchev finally arrived. Amidst a series of polemics, there at last appeared a reasonable settlement proposal. The missiles would be withdrawn from Cuba if the United States agreed not to invade Cuba. Well, that was an acceptable way out. Amid high hopes, XCOM began working up an immediate response. But before they could respond, on the very next morning on Saturday, day 12, a new letter from Kremlin was received, which made no mention of the letter the night before, now demanded that our Jupiter missiles in Turkey be removed as a quid pro quo of dismantling the Soviet missiles in Cuba. That had been the subject of 90% of the talk uh, at XCOM. That day would henceforth be dubbed Black Saturday, as the fog of war now descended uncontrollably over our hemisphere. Before that day was out, mankind would come closer to mutual assured destruction than at any time in recorded history. Tragic news reached XCOM. Major Rudolf Anderson, Jr., the very U-2 pilot who had discovered the Soviet missiles, had now been shot down, killed by sand missiles over Cuba. The kill had not been authorized by Khrushchev. It had been ordered by a subordinate anti-aircraft anti commander who took matters into his own hands. Soviet orders were unclear. General Plyev, the commander on the ground in Cuba, had been unable to reach Khrushchev for instructions because of poor communication lines. Khrushchev was greatly alarmed when he was informed. He reprimanded Plyev severely. Both Kennedy and Khrushchev were now sensitized to the very real possibility that a runaway commander, Ivan Moki, a playa, a LeMay, even a Cuban subordinate on either side could easily touch off a nuclear cataclysm. Then came perhaps the most critical Kennedy command decision of all. 
Kennedy finally determined to bypass XCOM as a deliberative body. There were too many conflicting opinions. Although he had previously agreed with XCOM to counter any shot down U2 with a retaliatory strike on SAM sites, Kennedy now countermanded that decision. No matter how justified such retaliation might now seem, the result could well be followed uh, by Soviet air action. In response, there would come a full retaliatory airstrike by us, an invasion by a U.S. force already assembled in Florida and codenamed Scabbard. The likely aftermath of an airstrike by us was key. The president would not let the ultimate decision to unleash the dogs of war be taken out of his hands by Curtis LeMay, his general staff, or the CIA, just as it had been taken out of the hands of a vacillating Kaiser Wilhelm by General von Moltke in August 1914. Khrushchev must be given time. But some things were beyond Kennedy's control. For on the night of that fateful Black Saturday came yet another blow. A U-2 on a routine flight taking air samples over the Bering Strait was confused by the Aurora Borealis, encountered navigational difficulties, and wandered into Soviet airspace. Soviet MiG fighters were scrambled. Could not have happened at a more critical moment. Had the MiGs located the U-2 before it scrambled back? to U.S. territory, the flashpoint of World War III could have been reached right then and there. The XCOM members, hearing that the U-2 was lost late that night, were devastated. Had fate now conspired with the magnificent glowing technicolor heavens over the Bering Strait to finally deliver the last straw to the survival of civilization? Ted Sorensen wrote, our little group, XCOM, seated around the cabinet table that Saturday continuous session felt nuclear war to be closer that day than at any time in the nuclear age. By a stroke of luck, the U-2 recovered its navigational bearings just in time over the Bering Strait to avoid the MiGs, but the threat was far from over. Three hundred miles from Bermuda, under the Sardasso Sea, Captain Valentin Savitsky in Soviet sub B-59, carrying a nuclear-armed torpedo and 5,000 miles from his home port at the end of his rope. His ventilation system, his electric compressors had broken down. Diesel coolers were blocked by salt. Crew was now desperate as temperatures ranged as high as 140 degrees beyond human endurance. The only solution was to surface for repairs. But he was surrounded, and he was being bombarded by death charges. Actually, our chase ships were only dropping hand grenades, not death charges. They were intended as just a signal warning him to surface and then head back east. But Stavitsky didn't know that. He believed that World War III had already been begun, and with good reason. The message from our Navy advising Moscow that hand grenades were merely a signal was never received by Stavitsky, like Flyev in Cuba. He'd been unable to communicate with Moscow for 24 hours. His frenzy was compounded by the fact that unauthorized personnel aboard one of our chase vessels had loaded the grenades into toilet paper tubes, thus delaying their detonation. The effect, according to the Soviet crewman, was that of depth charges, like being inside a metal barrel with someone continually blasting it with a sledgehammer. Stavitsky had already given the order to his nuclear torpedo crewman to prepare to fire when he was stopped from his suicidal move at the very last moment by Commander Vasily Arkhipov, who just by a stroke of luck happened to be aboard the B-59. Fortunately for mankind, Arkhipov held fast to one of three keys required for the nuclear launch and would not give in to an agitated and outraged Stavitsky who already held two of the keys in his hand. The B-59 then surfaced. Floodlight waters surrounded by American destroyers or curious crewmen. Our officers' attempts to communicate with Stavisky by bullhorn failed. 
after hasty repairs submerged and returned to Russia, both he and Arkhipov were charged with having disgraced the Soviet Union. The second Soviet response, which seemed to countermand the first, had mystified XCOM. Even cryptic handwritten notes of the meetings of the Politburo by member Vladimir Malin, uh, which were finally released by the Kremlin in 2003, do not explain why Khrushchev changed his mind, only that he was in sole charge. We now know that all of the decisions were those of Khrushchev and Khrushchev alone, not the remainder of the Politburo. At 4.30 p.m. on Saturday, day 12, Bobby and Ted Sorensen were delegated by XCOM to compose a letter to Khrushchev reflecting a crucial command decision. They would simply ignore the second gun to the head proposal, act as if it didn't exist, and reply only to the first proposal of the night before. At 8 p.m., JFK would transmit the communique to Moscow, demanding that all work on offensive weapons in Cuba cease immediately, that they be dismantled, withdrawn from Cuba, agreeing that it's a quid pro quo only that we would not invade Cuba. That's the formal telegram that went from JFK. But, critically, a select group of only six XCOM members stayed behind, together with the president and his brother, to craft a secret oral proposal suggested initially by Dean Rusk. RFK would meet with Dobrynin that night at 8 p.m. in RFK's office, the Attorney General's office, and promised privately that our Turkish missiles would be withdrawn in four to five months, that the promise would be that of the Kennedy brothers must never be revealed publicly. If it were, the deal was off. Conspicuously absent from this critical meeting of the select six with the president and his brother was Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson. Johnson would go to his grave unaware of the secret deal, believing that JFK had toughed it out with Khrushchev. More of this in next week's session. Robert Kennedy's meeting with Dobrynin at 8 o'clock lasted only 15 minutes. It was critical not only for what was said, but for what was not said. Dobrynin did not like Robert Kennedy. Um, in Robert Kennedy's one visit to the Soviet Union, RFK had been arrogant, been rude. He'd gone out of his way to offend his Russian hosts. Dobrynin had met with RFK many times, but he had never seen him like he was that night. Described RFK on Black Saturday as very upset, subdued, distraught, none of his usual combativeness, often staring at his children's pictures. He turned again and again to the theme. The time was of the essence. Decisions would be made within 24 hours, and we shouldn't miss the chance. And then he made reference as if in passing to many unreasonable heads among our generals, and not only among our generals, who are itching for a fight with irreversible consequences. This point, no doubt, hit home the hardest. The Soviet premier had long suspected that the Pentagon, not the boy Kennedy, was the real center of power in Washington. He was shaken when his own forces under Plyev in Cuba had broken ranks and almost started a war. Surely, Kennedy must face the same potential doomsday scenarios, and Khrushchev was painfully aware that he was vastly outgunned in terms of nuclear destructive capacity. After all, he thought, he had never intended to actually drop a bomb. The game was merely to gain tactical negotiating superiority by holding the imminent threat of nuclear war over the head of the frightened young John Kennedy. The youth, his own first son's age, the fop he had terrified at Vienna. He would extract concessions without firing a shot and then theoretically rise to the peak of the communist world, leaving the vaunted Chinese in the dust. But in Washington, pressures were now mounting dramatically as over 1,000 pickets marched in front of the White House, demanding that we bomb Cuba and pressures from Congress and within XCOM for retaliation and invasion were increasing. 
as the Soviet work in Cuba, 90 miles off our shore, went on unabated. Under relentless pressure from his general staff, the president now reluctantly gave in to LeMay and the XCOM, Hawks, and finally authorized an airstrike on the missile sites, but not until Tuesday, which would have been day 15, to be followed by an invasion of Cuba one week later. Late on Black Saturday night, after the communiques were sent and delivered, and as the country slept, XCOM stopped work physically and emotionally drained, knowing that the next day, Sunday, day 13, would be decisive and perhaps their last day on Earth. The rest of the tale is well known. Witness the fact that we're here talking about it today. In short, Khrushchev relented, and he couldn't get the news out fast enough. By written communique wasn't enough, so he did it by radio. The newscast came from Moscow at 9 a.m. the next morning, Sunday, day 13, announcing that Kennedy's terms are being accepted. The missiles were being dismantled, would rapidly be withdrawn. What then was the bottom line? We had in fact given in to Khrushchev's second demand, but in secrecy. Was that definitive? Probably not, actually. There are indications in the Malin notes of the Brazilian meetings that morning and the day before that Khrushchev had already passed the Rubicon and would have given in without the Turkish missile removal. He was thrilled, however, with the Dobrin and Telegram and would never reveal the secret deal to the world. And critically, Lyndon Baines Johnson would never know. Following Khrushchev's concession, the Chinese would uh, soon uh, ascend to the dominant position within the communist orbit. They would denounce Khrushchev's surrender as a fiasco and Khrushchev as a weak revisionist encouraging the arrogance of American imperialists. The Chinese would never again be viewed as an upstart secondary power. Both North Korea and North Vietnam would view Khrushchev's acts as a betrayal of a communist ally, and they would now look for a time to China, not the Soviet Union, for military assistance. Khrushchev's adversaries in the Politburo would eventually denounce him as an impetuous and reckless gambler, and indeed an azarki, whose harebrained reckless schemes had foolishly brought the country to the brink of humiliating and disastrous nuclear conflict. It was the beginning of the end of his reign for Nikita Sergeyevich. Two years later, he was removed from power. Kennedy now breathed freely for the first time in 13 days, wisely ordered XCOM not to brag publicly or claim victory. It was all over. When he entered XCOM, the boardroom that Sunday morning was given a standing ovation. George Ball was reminded of a painting by Georgia O'Keeffe, you may all know it, of a rose growing out of an ox skull. Life had magically emerged from the shadow of death. Curtis LeMay, who would later run for vice president on a ticket headed by George Wallace, characterized it as the greatest defeat in history we should invade today. Fidel Castro had already insanely written to Khrushchev, urging him on and vowing that he was fully prepared for the ensuing suicidal nuclear holocaust to save socialism. Now, cursing Khrushchev, he furiously kicked the wall, smashed a mirror when he heard the news of the Soviet surrender. But the world was safe, at least for now. And so it was that Jack Kennedy, Joe Kennedy's second son, boy wandered from Choate, Harvard, matured rapidly in the cauldron of the presidency during a period of 16 months following Vienna. His learning curve had been steep, and it had been treacherous. But taking a page from a seminal work on the outbreak of the First World War, he had succeeded in avoiding the deadly Armageddon of all-out nuclear war, despite CIA, general staff, congressional leaders spoiling for battle in a world seemingly gone mad. Mutual assured destruction was an outcome which could easily have resulted from even one miscalculation by his own staff, 
or by that of his tempestuous counterpart, the rough-hewn bully, the intimidating peasant child without a history, the inveterate gambler out of a mud hut with a thatched roof in Kursk. The players on the opposite ends of this chessboard were as unlikely a pair of adversaries as our world has ever known. Ironically, they had been locked in a demonic chess game, bound together by each other's frailties, each held hostage to the miscalculations of the other. But through it all, the 35th president of the United States had come of age, who were not at war. And somewhere, no doubt, Barbara Tuckman was smiling. Thank you. <laughs>